Welcome ladies and gentlemen to episode 7, part 1. In today's episode I'm going to be looking at Napoleon 1 to answer the very critical question whether it was from a drinking glass or from the DVD holder. That's a very important question because the answer determines whether Fred is guilty or not. As admitted by the judge himself when he said that if Napoleon 1 was from the DVD holder, it would mean that Fred is guilty because his alibi would mean nothing. And also during this episode, I will show you the arguments that the defense experts like Pat Wertheim and Ari Zilnberg came up with to support the drinking glass theory. And I will show you why these arguments hold no scientific merit whatsoever. So without further ado, let's get into it. So that slide shows Pauline 1 as it was lifted by Constable Schwartz at the crime scene. It measures uh, about 89 millimeters by 127 millimeters. As I mentioned before, this tag was completed by Constable Schwartz at the crime scene, and he placed uh, number one on it, and then in the comfort of his office later, he used his crime scene notes to complete the back of the folding. And here we can see some photos of the folding at the crime scene, open and lying face down on a pile of magazines, and in this photo, you can see it lying in the magazines there with the DVD disc on top of it. Uh, I mentioned before that Neville the Beer was asked to remove the disc from the player and then he placed it down on top of the open DVD. This slide is just to show you where on the DVD all these marks and prints would have been found. It is on the top half of the front cover of the DVD holder. This is a photo of the unsealed volume one with the cover and the tags removed. This was done by Roger Dixon. As you can see, he's working on it in this photo. Now, there were basically two foreign experts that testified uh, at the trial about volume one. And of the two of them, only Ari Zillenberg had access to photos of the uncovered volume one. At that time, did not have a photo of the uncovered volume one. This was only done after he completed his investigation and his report. He only worked from the first photo of the volume one I showed you. Now there are many different marks and prints on volume one, and we will discuss each one of these in a great amount of detail. And in no particular order, there is this uh, semi-elliptical mark, which the defense experts claim was made by a human lip in the process of drinking from the glass. Whereas uh, I will show you quite conclusively that this was made by a finger in a latex glove. Then we have the thumbprints. Uh, this is a print which uh, Pat Wertheim matched to the right thumb of Fred van der Feyfer. And according to Ari Zillenberg, this is a thumbprint. Uh, I must also note that Captain Bester at the time that he compared the prints he, he did not match this print to Fred from the paper. And then we get the left index fingerprint that was matched to Fred by Captain Bester and every other expert that looked at Pauline 1. We have a number of uh, dried marks of, of drops, drops of liquid that dried. And we have two wet blotches. Uh, indicating that there were uh, two little drops of liquid on top of the DVD at the time that it was uh, powdered. Then we have a number of unidentified smudges. And the background. You can see on Folion 1 we there are some very clean areas, also clean in between the marks here. And then the very critical and important top and bottom lines, which I will discuss in great amount of detail in today's episode. Now, according to the defense experts, Bertheim and Zillenberg and uh, Roger Dixon, which is at work for the police at the time, the top and bottom lines here on Folion 1 are consistent with the top and bottom lines of a conical drinking glass the edges of a conical drinking glass, wider at the top, narrower at the bottom. And this is Wertheim's proof. 
So Wertheim did uh, his own experimental lift from drinking glasses, and this is the lift that he produced from his glass number two. And it shows this, as one would expect, a, a curved edge here. And then he compares this with this portion of volume one, and because this appears curved, he therefore comes to the conclusion that this must therefore be from a drinking glass. No particular analysis was done to determine whether this is actually a curve, and if it was a curve, whether it was a circular curve, as one would expect it to be uh, if it was taken from a drinking glass. So if you overlay uh, the list made by Pat Bertham, and you put it on top of volume one, and you compare the top and bottom lines, you see some significant differences, especially in this area here. So admittedly, is they kind of line up fairly well in this area. But as you go on, there's some deviations that occur. You can see this this line here is the line on Pat Bertrand's lift, and the red line here is the line on Pauline 1. And you can also see the difference in curvature in the bottom line. This line is curved much more than this line. Uh, the fact that they are not there's some difference here is because uh, Pat Bertheim's glass was about 82 millimeters high that he used, whereas the distance between the lines are about 80 millimeters. So what Pat Bertheim did was he knew that there were some discrepancies here. Things weren't lining up in this area of, of volume one. Uh, and because it's quite clear that the red line and the blue line are, are not the same curvature. They don't follow the same alignment. And in order to remove that from his report, or for it not to become too obvious that there are problems with this uh, theory of a drinking glass, he cropped this area out altogether. We don't see this in his report. And you can see he only used this area here to compare with this little area on his print. And that was all done to create the illusion of consistency. And I believe a, a blatantly dishonest effort to mislead the court into accepting that this top line came from uh, the top room of a conical drinking glass. This is Zellenberg's proof. So what he did was he just drew a straight line and he noticed that the bottom line is doesn't follow a straight line alignment. And he basically says, the bottom line is clearly curved, consistent with lines from a glass. Once again, no further analysis to, to determine whether this is actually a curve to start off with, or if, if it was a curve, whether it was circular as one would expect it to be if it was from a drinking glass. So basically, as I mentioned before, the top and bottom rims of a circular conical glass will leave perfectly concentric and circular arcs in two dimensions. So if you were to take a conical glass like this and you were to cut it open and spread it out, you would get a perfectly circular arc here. If you were to complete it, it will form a perfect circle and this perfect circular arc over here. And they would be completely parallel and they will be concentric. In other words, they will have the same origin. And it is fairly simple using basic geometry and mathematics to determine the radius of the bottom line and the radius of the top line, just using the top diameter, the height, and the bottom diameter. And this is something that that Bertham could have done. Uh, he knew the dimensions of his class, and he could have calculated the radii, and he could have Try to fit curves on volume one with these radii to see what the fit would be. Uh, but as we've seen, he, he didn't do any any analysis of any kind. Everything was just based on, on visual observation. Also, if you look at the lift by a test lift done by Zillenberg, these top and bottom lines also form per, uh, perfect circles, as one would expect. But the fact is, uh, on this, 
and it's undisputed and uh, there, there's just no question about it is that the top line is not a circular curve and this has been confirmed not just by myself or by my brother Thomas but also by other academics uh, Thomas uh, was quite an ace with uh, graphical software and he played around a lot with 4-in-1 and he tried to put circular curves on it of different uh, radii and he was unsuccessful to put a curve that really fits the line well and, uh, and yeah he, he did quite a bit of work on that and, and he was unsuccessful and then myself and two professors Professor Kubus Fischer from uh, University of Stellenbosch and Professor Chris Theron from the University of Pretoria uh, did nonlinear regression analysis on the top and the bottom lines. Uh, and we can confirm that it was impossible for us to fit any type of circle through the top line and the bottom line uh, that is sufficiently uh, accurate. And we also did a uh, a structural assessment of the line by looking at the high definition photos of of all in one and i will show you those photos in uh, later in this presentation this was done by ourselves as well as by professor chris Ron. And, and in all these cases we came to the conclusion that the, that the top line is not a circular curve therefore it could not be from a drinking glass so this is uh, just to show you briefly the the regression analysis that i did so the regression Analysis is basically a mathematical process by which you try and put the best line through a series of points. So the points you see here is the coordinates of the top line on folium one. And then I try to put the circular curve through here. Uh, this is just to show you the output of my analysis. And I did this analysis for each one of the 10 glasses that Pat Bertheim used in his analysis. And you can see the R square values here. Now, an R square value is basically shows you the goodness of fit. And for a, a fit to be good, you got to have a very high R square value. We're talking about 80% or more. These are all very low. The highest was 34.8% down here. This is not good at all. None of none of these glasses produced a, a curve that would be considered a good fit. For the top line and fall in one. Similarly, uh, Professor Tron did a similar analysis and he came to the same conclusion. Uh, Professor Kubus Fischer from the University of Stellenbosch, he did uh, actually quite a clever analysis. So what he did was he first took a, a normal drinking glass, a dummy glass, he put prints on it and he put a folio on it and he took a lift and then he took the coordinates of the top and bottom line on that lift and he performed a regression analysis on it and it shows you the blue line is the curve that he fitted through the top markings on folion on his folion the black line is the line he, uh, he fitted through the bottom line on his folion and you can see a very good result uh, exactly what one would expect there was a common origin for both of them the lines are perfectly circular and perfectly concentric and parallel so this was basically done to just to determine whether the process would produce a, a good result a reliable result and we can clearly see that his way of reading coordinates and analysis he did produce what one would expect and then he used the exact same methodology on fall in one so he fitted a, a curve through the top line and he fitted the curve through the best line now when i say he fitted the curve this is just the best he could do it doesn't mean that the curve for good fits it's just the best curves that he could fit and based on uh, that analysis he found that and he basically found that the bottom curve on fall in one the best you could fit was a radius of 366 millimeters, whereas the best you could fit on the top line of Folion 1 was 119.5 millimeters. And also he found that the center of each of these circles do not coincide. So these are they're certainly not concentric. And it's also not what one would expect. One would expect the, this line to be 
to have a smaller radius than the top edge. So basically, if you take this information and you construct what the glass looked like from this information, it would have the glass would have looked like this. And this is what he say here. In other words, the hypothetical drinking glass is much, much wider at the bottom and has a very narrow opening at the top. Apart from having to be extremely tapered upwards, it also has to be extremely slanted. In other words, it would not have, it could not have been a, a truncated right circular cone as one would expect from a normal whiskey type glass. It defies my imagination what such a glass would exactly look like. And this is what I recreated here. In response to this report by Professor uh, Fischer, uh, Dr. Klasau said in the weekend August of February the 2nd, 2013, the exact geometry of the line produced by the lip of the glass depends on the geometry of the glass. And that's correct. And it can vary from a circle to a straight line as shown by differential geometry. That's correct. So if you have a perfectly uh, if you have a glass with the same top and bottom diameters, it would leave just parallel straight lines on the lift. But then he goes on to say that if the edge of glass is not properly regular, this may also distort the curve produced. So I failed to see that there was any drinking glass in existence with this type of shape that could have produced the lines in volume one. Professor Tron uh, looked at uh, different techniques to look at the shape of the top line, and he identified that the top line consisted of three segments, all of them straight line. The segment one is over this section, segment two is over this section, and then segment three over, over this section. And then he came to the conclusion that this is certainly not consistent with being a, from a circular curve from a drinking glass. Thomas and I were fortunate to obtain uh, some very high definition photos uh, of Folion 1. Uh, these photos were not available to Pat Bertheim or Ari Zellenberg. We know that Roger Dixon had the original Folion 1, but I don't know whether he actually took high definition photos of it and enlarged it in the same way that we did. Anyway, so here we have high definition photos of uh, Folion 1, and we, if we start looking at from the one side, we see, see kind of a straight line feature here and another one here. Uh, personally, I think this is just uh, an optical illusion in that this is all just part of the same feature. And then through the lifting process, there were some pieces that flaked out, fell off, to kind of produce the illusion of a groove through here. Uh, I think in, in, in reality, this is just one, one big uh, smudge. But if you go over to this side here, in this yellow box, which is now zoomed in here, you can see running from here through here, a straight, thin hairline feature. So this is not something that you would find on, on, on a drinking glass, something this straight. It's, it's very clearly visible running through here. And there it goes. And then in this particular area here, it's uncertain as to where that hairline goes. It wasn't picked up. And then you get this area, which is a kind of a dead zone. There's no real markings in this area. We don't know where the line goes or if, it was, if anything was picked up here. And then the hairline continues in this side, as you can see here. And you can, and you can see it here. And then one can kind of imagine that it follows something like this, a bit of a, a wavy line going through here to the edge. Now, a wavy line is not uncommon, as you can see here from a test lift uh, made by Pat Bertheim. Uh, his lift also shows some waviness in the line, so it is, it's, it's not uncommon. So I played around with this section here, and I... Uh, played around in some graphical software just to increase the contrast. And it is quite clear that the line feature that runs through here uh, perhaps extends through here to here, and then it disappears into the the coating and, and, and the covering over here. So the conclusion is there are a lot of straight line features on uh, Folio 1, which is certainly not consistent with it being from a drinking glass and perfectly consistent with it being from a DVD cover. Now, the bottom line is not a curve. 
and that is quite clear. As you can see here, it is just a jagged edge. There's all kinds of uh, jagged features in this line, as you can see it here. Yeah, you can see the line in its totality quite zoomed in. So this mark here is, is just a remnant of another blotch that was down here. And and the same this these lines may extend it down into the, the the area that was cleaned by the previous foliant. So the question may be, how was this bottom line made? Now foliant come in two sizes, a full size and a half size. Now quite often when they run out of the half sizes, they just take a full size and they cut it in half. And this is what Constable Swart said he did, that uh, he ran out of the half sizes, so he cut some of these full sizes in half. And simply what you see here is just him not cutting the polyon in a straight line. Uh, he, it was a bit of a jagged cut. So this was the top edge of the first volume he applied on the, over the bottom half of the DVD. So I'm just going to illustrate how this was done. As I mentioned before, uh, the, according to uh, Constable Swartz, he applied the first lift across the bottom half of the of the DVD cover. After removing it, he saw that uh, there were no usable prints, it was just smudges. So he discarded it. And there you see the jagged edge as he cut it. Now that left a clean area underneath here. There's the remnant of the, the bigger stain sitting here. And then a second folding was applied. And this is the folding that became to be known as folding one. And it picked up this edge here, and that is what is uh, interpreted by the defense experts to be uh, the bottom line of a, of a drinking glass. You see, the kind of consistency between what I show here and what you actually see on Folion 1. Now, to his credit, uh, Ari Zillenberg did try and do uh, some experiments with double lids, something which uh, Roger Dixon and uh, Pat Wertheim didn't do. So this is uh, the first lift which uh, Zillenberg took over the bottom half of the DVD. And this is then the top lift uh, that he took over the, the second lift he did over the top part of the DVD. And you can see the cleaned area left by, by this lift, clean area. However, he said there are some problems with, uh, you've identified some problems which indicate that Swartz was uh, not truthful in that this area on his left shows a lot of uh, remnant powder. And it also shows this bit of, uh, of the triangle here. So this, and he says, now because of this, because you don't see this in Folion 1, uh, th this whole double lift theory by uh, Swartz is nonsense. How does, Zillenberg know how big this triangle was on the first lift. He, nobody has seen this lift, it's just, it was thrown away. So Zillenberg is just assuming it to be the size. He is, assumes it to be maybe the size of the triangle on Polyon 1, but it, it doesn't have to be the same size. It could be smaller, it could be more slanted up like this. So he just made an assumption about size and then he used that size and he comes up with this little thing over here and then he puts that before the court as a fact as to why uh, the double of, double of theory by Swartz uh, is, 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 should not be trusted. So there's absolutely no basis for uh, Ari Zillenberg's argument that there's no corner visible. Now I want to talk about the issue about the difference in the background. So if you can see on Folion 1, it's quite clean. There's uh, areas, it's very black and shiny, no dust. And you compare that with the lift that Wertheim did and Ari Zellenberg. This is an example of a lift done by Pat Wertheim. You can see how much powder 
stayed behind on the sleeve of the DVD cover. And this was used as a big argument by them as to why this could not be from the DVD, because if it was from a DVD, it should have looked like this. Now, according to that work time, the reason why there's so much powder on, uh, on the sleeve of the DVD is because of static electricity and possibly due to chemical components of the plastic. I don't know where he gets this from, or there's no scientific basis for anything like this. Now, it is quite possible that at the time of the crime, the DVD cover or the sleeve, the plastic sleeve, did have some electrostatic electricity in it. Uh, it was bought by Inge, she handled it, she put it in a handbag maybe. It was handled uh, by somebody in the store. So in the process, through all the rubbing and the friction, uh, it, it did possibly pick up some el electrostatic electricity. But it doesn't mean that, that electrostatic electricity would still have been there at the time when the DVD uh, was used to, to produce Volume 1. So just, let's, just to illustrate uh, the couple of the factors that should have been considered, air humidity, for example. Uh, the more humid the air, uh, it absorbs and more evenly distribute excess charges. So this is an example of somebody walking on a carpet and the static charge on the human body is substantially reduced the higher the level of humidity is. It just shows you the impact of humi humidity on objects retaining electrostatic electricity. So if you look at the humidity conditions in uh, the area of Stellenbosch and Cape Town on, on the day of the murder and overnight and, and the next day. So the humidity levels were at about what almost 50% at the time of the murder. And then it increased uh, in an overnight. It became up to 100% until about the time that the uh, folion one was lifted. So the folion one was uh, exposed to a long period of very high humidity. And then obviously, as I said before, uh, static electricity can naturally discharge over time. Uh, we need to consider that the DVD remained unhandled and undisturbed in this position for a period of 17 and a half hours, face down on the magazine. So through a combination of humidity and the sleeve being in touch with another object, the level of any, any static electricity in that sleeve would have reduced to very, to very low levels by the time that uh, Folion 1 was lifted. Another important factor to consider is the electrostatic forces between the powder and the brass. So brushes work on the principle of electrostatic electricity in order to retain the powder. And then you rub it over the object and it sticks to the object because of the, the bodily secretions that form the fingerprint reaches. But if the object uh, has low um, levels of electrostatic electricity in relation to the brush, the powder would rather Used to remain on the brass than to stay behind on the surface. So it, it, it depends on the type of brush you also that you use because fiberglass brushes, for example, are known for their retention abilities. So I assume that because it has a higher level of electrostatic electricity and it, it, it does not shed powder very easily. Uh, animal hair brushes, for example, are known to, to, to deposit more powder than, for example, the fiberglass brush. So it's important to, to take all of these things in consideration when you try and, and replicate an experiment uh, to show you, to, to make a point about the, the powder that left on a, on a DVD cover. There is just no indication that Wertheim or Zellenberg tried to replicate these conditions. I, 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 again, the DVD cover remained untouched 
unhandled for a period of 17 and a half hours approximately in high humidity conditions. We do not know the exact type of powder nor the type of brush the Constable Swartz are used, nor was any attempt made to find out what he used in order to do a good replication of this particular experiment. So here is a video of my brother Thomas dusting a DVD cover and taking the two lifts from it. And it becomes very clear, and here you can see it for yourself, that there was absolutely no reason for there to be lots of powder on the DVD covers, as you would see in the photos by uh, Dillenburg and Bertheim. So it makes me wonder, what did they do to their DVD covers prior to their experiments? So how did the top line form? Now this is not an easy question to answer. There are uh, many different variables at play, but I'm just going to show you a few different things that could have played a role, either in isolation or in conjunction with one another. And yeah, it's, it's, it's a complicated thing, uh, following the top line, following one. It's a very difficult thing to replicate because uh, there's just, just so many variables to account for. But firstly, before we proceed, let's just look at uh, the features of, uh, of a DVD cover that, that could have played into the shape of the top line. Now, this photo here is supposedly a photo of the actual DVD that Inge took out. Uh, we know that uh, Inspector de Villiers returned this uh, DVD uh, to the video store. Uh, apparently, uh, the defense somehow retrieved this DVD cover from the store and somehow it made it to court where it was accepted as evidence piece number 21. And in between that process, it also came into the, the possession of Roger Dixon, uh, which he used in his experiments. But there is absolutely no reason to believe that this is the actual DVD cover. There was just no chain of custody. There were no paperwork with this DVD to show its chain of custody. And I can already tell you there's a huge gap, a huge issue with the chain of custody. Because on April the 18th, Fred van der Pfeiffer went to the video place. He opened an account. He took out uh, the same DVD that Inga rented, uh, The Stepford Wives. He would have been given this DVD holder and it would have been easy for him to simply remove the, the paper uh, component and to place it in a different DVD holder and nobody would know. So there's absolutely no reason to believe that this is the actual DVD cover and it is quite a pity that the court accepted this as such without asking for the, the the chain of custody information. Anyway, uh, so if you look at this DVD, a uh, lot of wear and tear. You can look at the at the edge here. You can see the curl back here, curling back here, the plastic. 
you look at the top edge here, uh, this, there's about a millimeter gap, I would say, between the plastic and the, and the edge of the, the black rim here, and the paper even sticking out. This is from another DVD from the video place. Also showing a lot of scratches. Uh, I see there's a lot of silver powder on here, so this must have been used in uh, their experiments by Roger Dixon. But you can also see in the top here some bending, potential curling. You can see a little bit of curling on this edge here. And the difference between the top and the bottom edges. A bit of uh, wear and tear in this corner here. And this is a, a new cover, unused or relatively new, because it is just there are no scratches. The edges are all nice and smooth. Now, it's very important to consider that this plastic sleeve is not attached to the DVD case underneath. Therefore, it is flexible and it has some room for movement. And especially if you if you were to place stick a polyon one on top of the sleeve and you were to press it, there is a potential for movement like this where the edge will become curved. And if you were just to press down, the top edge or of this will just slip up like this. If you take a folding and you place it and you bend it unequally, it will pick up more powder here than over here. So depending on how you bend the folding will impact the line that gets left on your folding. Also, we know that the prints were concentrated in this top corner of the DVD. This is the particular print that Swartz wanted to lift. This is the print that they observed to be very clear and bright. They actually said it flowered. So this was his primary objective. And then obviously while he was dusting, he saw this mark here. So there was a lot of a lot more dusting occurring in this area. And after the fallen was placed, there was also more pressure in this area than as opposed to perhaps this area. And that's why you would see a thickening of the line here as opposed to this area here. So just having this thickened line here, it's very consistent with the process it would have been followed to lift this print from a DVD cover. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, the DVDs probably take a lot of abuse, a lot of wear and tear, and quite possible that as you place the DVD in your handbag or the uh, different holders, that it can get caught here, the edges can curl up a little bit uh, over time, and then when you apply the brush over here, that there could be a bit of a deposit over here. And this could explain uh, this thickened line over here. Uh, just for context or for perspective, the thickness from here to here is only about a millimeter. So we're not talking a huge area. This is actually quite small. Uh, so I think curling is one of the ways that could have contributed to this thickening here, assuming that this groove here as caused by this groove here between the plastic of the DVD holder and the sleeve. So another thing that could have played a role is uh, what I call groove deposits. So as I mentioned before, and I've actually shown you on, on the DVD holder uh, that Inga supposedly uh, took out, is that there was a gap between the, the plastic sleeve and the DVD holder and that the paper sleeve was sticking out. So it's quite possible that during the dusting process, some powder was deposited in here over like this. So kind of obscuring the edge of this plastic, which would have prevented it from clearly showing on this lift. So in this particular photo with this scenario, this groove would then be this groove between the paper and the plastic. This deposit would be this and the edge of this would be somewhere hidden underneath here. It's quite possible that during the pasting of the folding that it's there could have been uh, some minor folding as I illustrated here. You can also see in the experiment which Thomas did earlier some folds in the folding in this area here. 
Now, I did my own primitive experiment where I took a DVD, I took a marker, I, I marked the edge of the DVD like this. I just pasted tape on, twisted it a bit here, went up, created the bubble in this area, as you can see. Then I applied pressure to pick up the line, and this was my result. Similar kind of clean area, slanted line down this way. And you have this very clean area here, so the question is, could this have been caused by uh, a fold? I don't know for sure, but I, I certainly think it is a possibility. Now, if you imagine pasting a uh, folion and, and, and it adheres to the plastic underneath and you were to somehow twist the folion, that it will distort the plastic sleeve, the edge of the plastic sleeve. And that could play a role. Uh, and let me illustrate to you how that could have contributed to the curved uh, shape that you saw uh, on, on folion one. So this is a photo of Constable Swartz showing my brother how he applied Polyon 1. So if we assume he, at this point in time, so he partially applied Polyon 1 like this, and then just with a slight twist, there's a, a, a bit of a twist in the Polyon 1 and uh, the, the plastic cowl goes up like this, and, uh, and the line just slopes down this way again. And then he continues to apply the rest of the volume and he picks up this line which is now like this. And then he applies the pressure and he picks up a little bit more powder in that process. And this is what it would look like, which is there, there's some similarity between the two. So I certainly do think that this is a possibility or one of the dynamics involved in, in, in what could have produced this line. And then if you look back at the print uh, which my brother produced uh, in the earlier video and you compare the two, you can see a thickening of the line here because this is where more powder was applied, this was more pressure was applied because this is where the print was that needed to be lifted. And it's very similar to what you see in Polyon 1, uh, very little here and, and more in this area. So there we have it, ladies and gentlemen. I have shown you beyond doubt that the top and bottom lines on volume one could not have been made by a drinking glass. They are not circular curves, which they should be if they were from a drinking glass. And I've shown you how the bottom line could have been made on a DVD holder. And I've also shown you possible ways of how the top line could have been from a DVD holder. But if you're not yet convinced of the arguments I've made, I will continue in the next episode to look at the other marks on Volume 1, the drops, the semi elliptical mark, the fingerprint, the thumbprint, etc. To continue driving home the point that Volume 1 was not from a drinking glass and that it was from the DVD holder that Inger rented at 7 past 3 that afternoon, which means that Fred's alibi was worth nothing. I hope you enjoyed this episode and look forward to continuing this discussion in the next one. Thank you.